The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Eborn, and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and for participating in our webinar about topics from the book, School Nursing, a Comprehensive Text. Joining us today are the three editors of the book, Janice Seligman, Robin Shannon, and Kathy Yonkaitis. These three women are school nurse leaders and are certainly expert, experts in the field of school nursing, and we very much appreciate their generosity for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here with us today. We'd also like to thank each of you for joining. We know that your health rooms can be very busy during this time of day, and we hope that this is an hour well spent for each of you. Before I turn the time over to Janice, Robin, and Kathy, I would like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. First of all, we will not be taking audio questions during the webinar, but we would encourage you to submit questions for Janice, Robin, and Kathy through the questions interface in GoToWebinar. You can submit your questions anytime during the presentation, and at the end of their presentation, we will uh, take a moment to answer the questions that have come in. We may not get to all of the questions, but we will uh, make a, a very good effort to reach out to you after the webinar if we're not able to answer your question during the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be posted on our schoolhealth.com YouTube channel. Uh, we will also email uh, this link to each of you for future playback. So if you're not able to attend the full presentation or, or any of it, uh, rest assured we will be able to send out a link to the recorded um, presentation for you to watch later. And uh, additionally, everyone who is attending today will be receiving a certificate of attendance for joining us. Um, you should receive that attached to an email within the next couple of days. Um, and then lastly, if you're having any technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please contact GoToWebinar directly, and I have their phone number here. It is 855-352-9003. And now let's turn the time over to Janice, Robin, and Kathy. Well, I thank you, Kathy, if you'll advance. Uh, these are the three of us, and our emails are there if you wish to get in touch with us um, at another time. We're available for you. I am Dr. Janice Seligman. Uh, I'm a professor emeritus from the University of Delaware, probably better known to you as the editor of School Nursing Comprehensive Text, as well as the author of School Nursing Certification Review. I am delighted to be with you. Uh, because I'm really your biggest fan, and I really admire all that you do. School nurses usually practice independently because they're often the only health-related person in the school. You do indeed have superpowers, and you're very creative. But there is no medical team on whom you can rely to assist you in understanding the issues regarding a student's medical care. Hopefully, you have others in your district who can provide assistance by phone. But what resources are available to you on your desk? What questions should you be asking? What observations should you be making? And what are the legal considerations you face? If you've practiced nursing before 2005, advance, you may remember that there were very few resources available for school nurses. NASN had a number of small booklets on individual topics such as vision and hearing screening. It was also a book on legal issues related to school nursing by an independent company. But almost everything else had to come from your state or your school district. The absolutely number one resource that you should have available to you is your State Nurse Practice Act advance. That will supersede all other documents to guide your practice. It dictates what you can and cannot do in order to keep your license. When school nurses ask, can I delegate this? This is the document that I'll answer that first. 
So please have this available. It is your first piece of legal advice. In 2000, NASN reached out to me and asked me to, to develop a state of the science resource book that would incorporate all of the relevant conditions and issues that school nurses were being asked to address. Never before had there been a book that served as a comprehensive resource for practicing school nurses, as well as a textbook for those who were studying to be school nurses in the states that required it. It was to describe the full spectrum of all aspects of school nursing practice, as well as to provide guidance and evidence-based practice. So in 2005, the first edition of School Nursing, a Comprehensive Text was born. That's the blue one. It was written by school nurses for school nurses. It was written by those who know your practice and your issues. Many of you have come up to me at your school nurse state conferences to show me your dog-eared memo flag copies, just to show me how useful the book has been to you. It was a landmark publication for our specialty and was voted book of the year by the American Journal of Nursing. When the second edition came out in 2012, that's the white one, I was frequently asked by school nurses if they really needed to buy the updated version. And here's how I usually re replied to them. Would you go to a physician whose last reliable source of information was seven years old? Would you trust his diagnosis and his treatment plan? Well, during that seven year interval, a lot changed. The criteria for concussion changed. The standards of practice changed. Terms changed, such as changing mental retardation to intellectual disability. And exercise-induced asthma became exercise-induced bronchospasm, since exercise doesn't cause asthma. In addition, we realized we had missed some very important components, like laws. The McKinney-Vento Act was not in the first edition. And conditions such as Marfan syndrome and heart disease was also absent. During the first 10 years of the text, its use expanded beyond the school health office and university classrooms to also include courts of law. Increasingly, as schools were being sued, the book was being used by attorneys to describe, next slide, what a reasonably prudent school nurse would be expected to do. That's actually in order to rule out negligence and to show that you were not. It has become the gold standard for school nursing practice. While what is written in the book is not law, it does describe best practice and evidence-based practice. It was actually in a court of law where I was an expert witness that an attorney told me that I did not have anything on the care of the student with cardiomyopathy in that first edition, which of course was the focus of the case. That content is certainly there now. One of the prime sources for what needs to be added to the editions of the book comes from you, the school nurse. You have provided great ideas and questions via the NASN listserv, discussion groups, and by discussion with me in person and online. So another seven years has passed and a new edition was published in 2019. What makes this edition different? First of all, I have two wonderful co-editors to share the burden. But we heard you. And one of the things you requested a lot was to have more individualized healthcare plans. You wanted practice tools, policy examples, and resources. There's an updated definition and framework for school nursing practice. The DSM-5 was published, leading to multiple changes regarding mental health disorders. There's new information on peanut allergies, violent intruder interventions, issues regarding the transgender student, and information on vaping and electronic cigarettes, which wasn't even developed at the last edition. Adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, as well as how to implement trauma-informed care is also included. So as I prepare to turn the text to the next generation, my new co-editors 
also added their, their special touches. Next slide. Tidbits of interesting information are inserted into boxes titled, Did You Know? and Practice Connection. You can see these are little pieces of information to enhance your knowledge base so that the uh, practice connections describes these specific aspects of school nursing practice that may not be shared by the majority of school nurses. One example is administration of allergy shots. We especially paid attention to your frequent requests for those IHPs and the many questions you had on this topic. At least once a week on the NASN listserv, school nurses are asking for an IHP on a particular condition. When I inform them that there's an example in the book of that condition, they often indicate they don't yet have a copy. So having the book would certainly make your lives easier. Here's a list of many of the conditions for which we have IHPs included in the book. Remember that only the symptoms that require intervention or assessment need to be included. Therefore, you don't need the entire, you don't need the IHP to include absolutely everything about the particular condition, especially if it's not relevant to the student. Here's a hint of how you can modify most of these to fit your needs. If you have a student who has a condition that affects his joints, such as Lyme disease, Perhaps you can modify the IHP on juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Someone with chronic lung disease may need some of the same assessments and interventions as with asthma or cystic fibrosis. Pick the symptoms the student has or might have. How does the condition present itself? Then you can devise the problem list, the relevant assessments and the interventions that are appropriate. Remember that the IHP must be individualized and not just a standardized form. What symptoms does this student have that impact on your care? What meds does he take and how does he take them? What's the best way to catheterize this student? Uh, this is one of the first documents that you will be asked to produce if the legal department for your school district is involved in a case. There are multiple different presentation styles for the IHPs in the book, as there is more than one way to write an IHP. And we wanted to give you ideas for many different approaches. In addition, there are a number of emergency action plans. We have consistently, next slide, referred to them as action plans rather than emergency care plans. As we are not asking non-nurses to provide care, we are asking them to take action. There's also an entire chapter that answers the questions of differentiating an IHP from an EAP from a 504 accommodation plan. Remember that the IHP is written by the nurse and for the nurse and his or her substitute. It is not written for the teachers. That would be the emergency action plan. So I put together some tidbits from the book that may answer some of your most frequently asked questions and misperceptions. First of all, the IHP must be written by a registered nurse. It's a skill that cannot be delegated because it requires your nursing knowledge and your nursing judgment. Your role is to take the medical orders and recommendations that have been written by a licensed prescriber and translate them for the school setting into this document. I'll go to the fourth one there in that the family also has a role in giving you input as to what will work best for this student. So the question, one of the questions I get asked is, does every student with a chronic condition need one? And the answer is no, they don't. According to the ANA, it is only for those with or at risk for physical or mental health needs. So what specific care do they need and what assessment is needed? Other things that are needed 
in the or pearls for the IHP is it should set priorities in order for you to have continuity of care. It should include outcome measures. And as I noted before, the IHP is a legal is your legal documentation of the care that was provided or planned for this student. It certainly is a mandated document if in fact you also, if the student qualifies under IDEA to have an individualized education plan developed. Probably the uh, most controversial question uh, or comments that I get as I go to your different state conferences is that many of you have been asked, mandated, to distribute your IHPs to the faculty and staff. First of all, the IHP contains protected student health information. So it is covered under FERPA and can only be shared with, the information can only be shared with those who have a need to know, not those who are nosy and would, it would be nice to know. But the IHP is updated frequently. It's updated as the medications change. It's updated as the teaching that you're doing with the student change. And usually when you have distributed something, it's gonna last all year. So it may need to have parts redacted, the favorite word for the year, before you share these with the IEP team. If it is also helpful to get permission from parents before you share certain information. But the IAHP itself is not what is distributed to the faculty. That would be the emergency action plan, which I'll address in a moment. So now my most humorous type of question that I'm asked is what the principal said. Well, I chuckle because I, one of my children is a principal and he had no clue what an IHP was. But principals do not usually understand IHP and they often don't even understand FERPA, especially as it uh, impacts on the IHP. And they may give you a mandate that this must be distributed. And <clears throat> clearly that may not be allowed by your Nurse Practice Act by FERPA, and if they insist, you may need to involve your state school nurse consultant to help you. Um, however, one of the compromises is to say, I will distribute the emergency action plan and put the descriptions of what they need in that document. So as an aside, which doesn't have to do with the uh, IHP exactly, uh, many principals also don't understand what a school nurse does. They don't understand your role. If that's the case, my recommendation is you take the textbook and you lay it on their desk and say, um, I'm responsible to know and practice everything that's in this book. It is not something you can give the secretary because they can't do that. It's not something you can give an aide because they don't know this. But anyway, that's an aside. My last point is to point out that the IHPs are written in nursing language, whereas the emergency action plans are written in lay language. The IHP is by the nurse and for the nurse, whereas the emergency action plan is for teachers and staff. And it is here that if parents give permission, you can um, share with the staff what the student's condition is and what it's all about. So also within this third edition of the text are a lot of helpful charts and guidelines and descriptions that can enhance your practice. So as I turn this over to my colleagues, I leave you with my closing message. This book is my legacy to you and I have assured its continuation with my co-editors. Use it to help guide your practice. Use it to make a difference in the lives of children in the school, in the community, and in your profession. School nurses are special, and I thank you for all you do for the children. 
And with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Kathy Youngkaitis. Thanks, Janice. So um, I'm Kathy Youngkaitis. I am uh, currently a clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, and I'm a school nurse. I worked in mostly elementary settings uh, while I was practicing. And uh, for the last several years, I have been um, working with school nurses and nurses who want to become school nurses um, to help them learn about, uh, about school nursing and some of the things that we're talking about today and a lot of the things that are included in the textbook. Um, however, for today, I was asked to talk a little bit about the legal responsibilities of involving a school nurse in special ed. So um, just like Janice was talking about in terms of many educators, including administrators, don't understand um, much about IHPs and things. It wasn't in their education. I'm, I'm not trying to lay anything on them. The bottom line is, is it wasn't part of their preparation. So it's our job to know what our job is. And our job is also to help um, others understand our responsibilities. So I thought uh, in terms of special education and your and your role as a school nurse, I'd start off just by kind of reminding you or just kind of um, pointing out that uh, what dictates our role or what um, the legal parameters of a role really come from Section 504 of the Rehab Act and IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. And uh, we normally call it IDEA, when they updated it in 2004, they added another I in there, but no one, it's kind of like a silent I. So um, every student has rights under IDEA or IDEA, and also every student has a right to a free and appropriate education. So these are kind of the major tenets, if you will, that guide uh, our responsibilities, everyone's responsibilities in terms of the school and the district and the state um, and the practice and the educators and the school nurses and everybody else. This is what guides us. So in thinking about children with special, um, who may need special education, um, what part do you think we have as a school nurse or what part of that should we be involved with as a school nurse? Well, the first thing we want to think about is what are the pieces to the special education process? So a lot of people will call it, oh, what is my role for an IEP? But I really pull it out and say, hey, 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 wait a minute. IEP is one part of what we're talking about. We're talking about what are our responsibilities to children who may need special education, who may need special services in order to learn. And in particular, we're talking about students with special health care needs. But in general, this applies to any, any student in terms of special education. So there are these five areas, or this is the way um, it's most easily broken down to describe the special ed process. Uh, the very beginning is identification, or what they call child find. Then there's the full and individual ed evaluation. There's eligibility determination. Then there's that IEP. We all tend to kind of uh, talk about when we're talking about special ed. And then there's the placement of the student in their LRE, which means their least restrictive environment. So you're probably familiar with all of these stages, but let's go back to the question. So what is the, what part should the school nurse be involved in? Well, all of them. So we can have a part in identifying a child, or we may have a student who that we're working with that may um, benefit from evaluation for special education. We certainly should be doing that evaluation, that full and individual evaluation. And then in terms of the last three stages, we should be talking, um, be part of the IEP team or the team that needs to determine the eligibility of the student for special ed, the development of that IEP, and then the placement. What I'm saying is you should have a seat at the table, right? I like this picture because that's, well, we don't all look different colors, but we're all putting that puzzle together. We're all sitting around a table and we're all talking about what's going to be best for the student with the family and sometimes even with the student. So the bottom line is, is that school nurses and other school support personnel really have an important role as members of the education team. Um, and if we don't have that seat at the table, if we're not involved with that, uh, those meetings and those decisions, uh, we aren't serving students very well. Um, and students may not be getting the services that they deserve. So why do I think that that's the case? And how could you uh, share with 
maybe someone who doesn't believe that you should have a seat at the table, uh, that, that indeed you belong there. So I thought I'd pull out these two little tidbits from the, I don't know if laws are allowed to be called tidbits, but I'm calling them tidbits, um, this information from IDEA. And the first is that in evaluation and reevaluation, you'll see it written here, that a student has to be assessed in all areas related to their susceptive dis suscept <laughs> suspected disability. So, and it even outlines that health is one of those suspected, suspected disabilities. Wow, that's a tongue twister for me today. So the point is that IDEA very clearly states that students should be evaluated for uh, or reevaluated for health uh, among other things, if it's appropriate, all right? So yes, there is a place for health evaluation in the IEP, um, and then you say, okay, well then who should be doing it? Okay, there's more in the law. It tells us that. It says that if information is needed on a domain, so health would be considered a domain, then a special ed education team member qualified to collect the data is identified. All right, who is the person qualified to collect health information. Right, the nurse. So let's take a look. Um, IDEA also delineates the team very specifically in talking about the people that you see these um, icons that you see on the screen here. So they say you have to have a regular ed teacher, a school administrator, a par the parent, the student when it's appropriate, and a lot of times we're seeing student-led IEPs nowadays, and a special ed teacher. So those are clearly defined. But IDEA also includes that others can be included as needed. So that might be um, a support person for the parent, could be a lawyer, could be an advocate, could be all sorts of different people. Maybe someone who's providing therapies or services outside of the school, all right? But it also clearly indicates that you need to have an evaluation or an interpreter, interpreter of the evaluation. And that's where the school nurse comes in. Not only should we be the ones evaluating the student, but then we have to interpret that evaluation for the team. We're the expert in that area. So if a student is having a, a, has a health concern and you're evaluating their health, then you should be at the table providing that um, interpretation as well as answering questions and participating in the discussion. So why aren't the nurses there? Well, I cut out this little banner, you know, the one that says we've our little pin, we've always done it that way. I hear that a lot, and as we all know, that's no, no reason. Often I hear that there's no time or no coverage, and again, we have to go back to what does IDEA require, and if there is no time or no coverage, then that, needs, that discussion needs to be had with um, administrations and school boards, all right? Sometimes people tell me they're not invited. Well, again, same theory in that we, it's, it's mandated by law, and so again, a, um, careful, thoughtful conversations need to be had sometimes with whoever's running your IEP team, sometimes with your administrator. It really, it really depends, but I'm hoping that by providing you some of the uh, wording straight out of the IDEA law, that that will help you to get invited. And again, we don't wanna be a bully. We don't wanna bully our way into these meetings. We wanna ha have conversations, thoughtful conversations ex to explain why it's important for us to be there. And the other and the most um, bone chilling uh, reason that I've heard is that someone else is conducting the health evaluation. This I've heard other psychologists, social workers and other um, individuals are collecting health evaluations. And um, as we clearly saw, that is not IDEA's intent. You, they are not the expert in health. So let's talk about it for just another minute before I turn things over. Uh, what is your role then in special education? Well, I kind of alluded to this when I was talking about the different um, areas of special education um, process. So, as I said, you can refer students for evaluation. You should be evaluating students. You are the health expert and writing reports and submitting them. Now, if you find a student doesn't have a health concern, you can go to the IEP meeting, provide your report, describe how you do not feel that the, that the um, health condition is impacting the student's ability to learn. And then if it's necessary, you can be excused. I don't encourage nurses to be excused if there is a health concern that is impacting learning because you need to, to be there um, as part of uh, the discussion. So I guess I covered bullet three, providing your evaluation results and consulting with the team. Absolutely, if there's a health concern impacting learning, you need to be doing that. 
Who's writing goals? I wish you guys could raise your hands for me. I think I'd see very few. And that's a problem because everyone else on the team is writing goals and it seems very reasonable. Why would we have, why do we have speech goals? So we can measure how a student does with speech. So why wouldn't we have health goals if we have students' health impacting their ability to learn? You're also gonna be um, including in the IEP if, if necessary, direct care or supervising care, but you're never gonna be delegating the care. And Janice alluded that um, because your judgment uh, you're never going to be de delegating your judgment because nursing judgment is never delegated. So again, just like we wouldn't delegate it to the social worker or the psychologist or the principal, um, we don't delegate uh, delegate any of the care um, here in the IEP meeting. And one last tidbit, this is my pearl about consult minutes. If the student has a health concern but doesn't require any nursing minutes or um, any inter nursing interventions, ask for consult minutes so that you continue to be part of the team and monitor the student because we, we know as they grow and change, a lot of times um, their health conditions and their needs will change as well. And this will keep you kind of on the list um, consulting with the teachers and family. So finally, let me just talk about the ramifications of not being involved. Well, obviously the impact of health the health concern might not be recognized. I've seen this many times. We could have uh, missed or improper accommodations or modifications related um, to this health concern. So maybe the people making the choices might not know um, what the pro proper accommodations that are needed. And then finally, this one's more um, kind of legal and school related, but it's still important. If the parent protests and a case goes to due process and a student get, uh, didn't get a proper evaluation of their health concern by the nurse, um, the parent, uh, the district might be liable because the proper evaluation and interpretation wasn't made. So I know this was really quick and brief. We have a whole chapter on this in the, in the textbook um, to talk about these things, but we want to give an opportunity to talk about them for a few minutes today and maybe pique your interest. So I appreciate you listening and I am going to hand over uh, to Dr. Robin Shannon. Thanks, Janice and Kathy, and hello, everyone. I'm Robert Adair Shannon, and I'm a clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois Chicago at Chicago College of Nursing, and I recently took over from Kathy as the director of the School Nurse Certificate Program, and I've been a school nurse since 2000, so this information um, is near and dear to my heart, and um, I wish it had been around <laughs> when I first began practicing back in the day. I also want to mention quickly that Janice, Kathy, and I are nationally certified school nurses, and we really hope um, uh, that the textbook will help you to prepare for the national board certification for school nursing exam when you take it. So I'm going to talk about the school nurse's role in emergencies and disasters. There are two chapters in the textbook that inform best practices for when a crisis occurs at school. The first is chapter 19, it's entitled Students with Acute Illness and Injury, which outlines how to care for individual students who are severely ill or injured. This chapter was written by a team of experts in school nurse emergency care, and it describes the principles of systematic assessment and triage, as well as evidence-based treatment for students experiencing experiencing a whole host of acute conditions. So you name it, and it can happen at school, right? Anything from respiratory emergencies like asthma or pneumothorax, circulatory emergencies such as shock and cardiac events, anaphylaxis, neurologic emergency, toxicologic emergencies such as poisonings or exposure to hazardous materials, and all kinds of trauma to all areas of the body, which um, I thought was well depicted by this playground scene. Um, any number of <laughs> emergencies about to unfold with, for those kids. It also talks about bites, stings, and burn care. One condition discussed in this chapter that many school nurses may not be familiar with, for example, is um, the care for a student with sickle cell disease who's in vaso-occlusive crisis which can be a life-threatening and very scary emergency. Next slide, please. So now I wanna go a bit more in depth and give you information about the chapter on emergency, disaster, um, emergency and disaster preparedness and response in schools. 
chapter 20. So in contrast to um, responding to individual students with acute illness and injury, here we're talking about crisis situations that involve multiple victims or multiple casualties. Emergencies and disasters may come with warning, often sudden and un unexpected, or I'm sorry, or they can uh, come on suddenly and unexpectedly. So suffice it to say that these are scary and chaotic, complicated events, which call for an informed and coordinated approach. And the school nurse is essential to these efforts. The terms emergency and disaster are terms that are often used interchangeably, referring to crisis or critical incidents. But although they have many common characteristics in this context, it's important to differentiate the two. So what's different? An emergency is generally understood to be a dangerous event that can be managed at the local response level. So with municipal police, fire and emergency medical services and area health and hospital systems. Conversely, a disaster is a dangerous event that causes significant human and economic loss and demands a crisis response beyond the scope of local uh, resources. So really the difference between an emergency and disaster and a disaster is in terms of the dimension of that impact and how we respond. So what kind of emergencies and disasters are we talking about? So let's take a minute just to imagine that you are the school nurse when the unimaginable strikes. When preparing and planning, it's helpful to think of critical incidents in a few different buckets um, to see if you and your school are prepared to deal with such events. So the first bucket would be things uh, such as natural disasters. And depending on where you live on the planet, uh, the exposure to national hazards or national disaster, uh, natural disasters is different, but um, such threats include earthquakes or tornadoes, lightning, severe winds, such as from hurricanes, um, floods, wildfires have been uh, rampant on the west coast of uh, recent, extreme temperatures, landslides, um, people in uh, coastal communities could even have tsunamis and volcanic eruptions. So uh, whatever kind of natural um, landscape and the threats that that can um, propose in your area. Now we have the bucket that's more universal of technological hazards. And these are things like explosions or release of toxins from industry, accidental um, releases of hazardous materials like a gas leak in a school or a laboratory spill. And we have the bucket of biologic hazards. Uh, so this means things like infectious disease, um, pandemic influenza, or say even um, a few years ago, we had, uh, were faced with a, Ebola outbreaks. And remember that it was a school nurse who first alerted the public health agencies in New York in 2009, I believe, to the H1N1 outbreak. And then think about today's news, we're on high alert for the emerging, emerging cases of the coronavirus. Um, and biologic hazards also includes food outbreaks um, uh, that affect large numbers of uh, school community members such as the norovirus. And then lastly, we have adversarial or incidental um, events, and these are human-caused threats, um, such as uh, fires being started. Janice alluded to violent intruder events or active shooters, which of course are on the rise and extremely concerning. Um, other criminal threats or actions such as gang, uh, gang violence or bomb threats, um, and um, uh, the um, terrible thought of domestic attacks that impact um, the public on a large scale, public services, uh, such as water and power and communication systems. So those are kind of the unimaginable things um, that we have to imagine when preparing for emergencies and disasters. Next slide, please. So the federal government mandates that response agencies, including schools, take an all hazards approach that they are ready to respond in any event, 
like the ones I just mentioned. Prevention and mitigation are sometimes considered together as one phase, and this is where efforts concentrate on identifying and assessing potential threats, as well as working to mitigate or reduce the risk or potential impacts before the crisis occurs. And once the potential threats are assessed, the next phase is preparedness or readiness in which response plans are developed and practiced, which is really the meat of the matter, and I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. But often overlooked but vitally important is to think ahead to after the emergency or disaster and plan for how your school will work to provide a healing environment and establish a new normal for the school community, especially when there's devastating loss of property or services, or even unfortunately deaths. So for example, where would school be held if there's no school or the school is not accessible for any reason? Next slide, please. It's vitally important for school nurses to understand how their school community fits into the wider scheme of emergency and disaster preparedness among federal, state, and local governmental agencies, school systems, and even private sector and non-governmental agencies. Events that exceed the capabilities of any single entity alone require a, a unified and a coordinated natural approach to these domestic incidents and how to manage them. So to address this imperative, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has established the National Response Plan, which includes the National Response Framework and the National Incident Management System, commonly referred to as NIMS. And these two documents, these last two documents, are meant to work together. The National Response Framework provides the guidance for development of policies and procedures that coordinate, prepare, and respond, and recover from um, a critical incidents, where the National Incident Management System provides a template of how to manage a crisis incident. So there's often a lot of confusion about these different um, lines of authority and these different systems, and so they're clearly outlined in the textbook for you. Next slide, please. So what does this all mean for you as a school nurse and your school's emergency and disaster planning? Well, schools are responsible first and foremost for forming a school emergency operations team or a school crisis team, whatever it's called in your district. But a school emergency operations team is what it's called under the NIMS framework. So this chapter um, outlines a standardized and systematic way uh, to determine uh, priority goals and objectives and the essential structure and components of this school emergency operation plan in your area. So it will be your unique plan that outlines the roles and responsibility of all the team members and the school staff, um, which I think you'll find extremely helpful. But it's not enough to have a good plan on paper, right? The school emergency operations team also has to ensure that the plan is understood, practiced, and regularly reviewed. Next slide, please. Because emergency and disaster scenarios involve the potential or real threat of injury, illness, and loss of life, you, the school nurse, as a trusted expert in student and health in student health and safety must serve as a leader in school operations uh, for emergency and disaster preparedness and response. You as an educator need to ensure that current evidence-based resources are used for training and that you serve as a liaison between local agencies to train the school staff on how to be ready to respond and recover um, for emergencies and disasters. Well, most of the preparedness strategies discussed in this chapter have universal applicability. Um, there is more in-depth information on a couple of select potential emergencies, namely uh, pandemics and active shooter events, um, like I said, unfortunately, are becoming uh, way too prevalent. And so we hope that this additional information um, helps you to become confident when that unimaginable uh, event happens. Next slide. 
So before we turn it back over to Ryan, Janice and Kathy and I want to thank you for listening. We want to thank you for applying the knowledge and skills you gain from school nursing a comprehensive text and taking that information back to your practice in the school communities that you serve. And thanks so much for all you do for so many on behalf of the better health and the education of kids. We really, really appreciate you. And um, thanks for listening. Ryan? Thanks, everyone. This has been a lot of really great information, and we very much appreciate you taking the time to, to share this with us today. Um, while you've uh, all three been giving your presentations, we, we have received some questions that have come in, and uh, I'd like to go through some of these now if we can. Um, first question asks about the editions of the book, and I, I know that Janice, in our conversations, you know, we've been talking a little bit about the different editions, but uh, Kristen asks, if you have the first edition, uh, but not the second, should you purchase the second along with the third edition? Uh, this is Janice, and the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> we have updated it. Uh, there is no reason for you to buy each of the editions. Uh, the state of the science care is within the third edition, and that should be the source that you would be using. So no, you don't have to go back and buy the second edition. Great. Fantastic. Thanks, Janice. Nice to hear that you're thinking of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question from Kelly about uh, IHPs. If a child with asthma uh, who uses an inhaler but not frequently, so they use the inhaler maybe once or twice during the year. Would you recommend that they have an IHP? There, there are no yes or no's for many of these types of questions. Um, if you are the school nurse in that school uh, five days a week, all day, um, and if the school is not terribly large, perhaps you don't need it. If you have uh, substitutes that come in often, uh, if you are in a state that allows you to delegate um, so that you have information on file, then it may be helpful. So again, think about um, uh, to whom you, with whom you share the responsibility for the care of this child. Um, how likely are you to remember this child um, amongst 1500 students versus if you have a school that has 300 students so it's not a yes no it's um think about all the parameters and then decide how you wish to proceed from that also think about the parents and you know is there a, a litigious nature uh, of the parents and should you just have one on file just in case to make everybody happy would that take care of their angst of having a child who may only need an inhaler once a year. Janice, can I add on to your, what please, please share? Yes. So this is Kathy. And the one other thing that um, I think is important and depending on what state you're in, it may be mandated. For instance, in Illinois it is, but what kind of um, training or education are you providing to the teachers and staff in your school about um, asthma? and um, being able to identify if a student is in some sort of distress. So thinking about it, you know, taking a step back and not thinking about just that um, one student, but how can we be sure um, that we're um, prepared for any student? Because you know what, for as many students as we have identified who have asthma or you're using a, and occasionally use an inhaler, there's probably as many or more that we don't know about. And so um, just being prepared, certainly if a student needs a care plan, I'm not saying that there, you shouldn't have a care plan, but again, just kind of backing it up a little bit and just reminding um, everyone that we should have um, some strategies in place to make sure that um, we, if we have a student who's in distress and particularly um, with a breathing difficulty, um, that um, our, we've d provided that training. Good point. And this is Robin. I'll chime in as well. Um, so it's always the individual nurse's decision. It it's, takes nursing judgment. Um, but for the students that we can say, yes, they absolutely need an IHP, 
would be students who have an individual education program or who have a Section 504 plan. So in accompanying those plans, the IHP is extremely supportive. Sometimes what we see is that the IEP or the 504 plan goes into extreme details. So let's take, for example, a student with diabetes, and it outlines what happens over every period of the day um, according to the student's schedule, the medications they take, the carb ratio, you know, those kinds of things. And that's a lot more information that is needed in a 504 or an IEP. But what you can do is say in those plans that, um, that this student will receive school nursing care according to the current medical orders and the individualized health care plan that's on file in the nurse's office. So that covers a lot of ground for you without putting really sensitive health information in the IEP or the 504 and that allows you to update the IHP um, as often as needed without, you know, kind of annoying the whole IEP or the 504 team to reconvene every time there's a change in the student's status. So those, that's my couple tidbits. Excellent information. Thanks, thanks to all of you for uh, giving your thoughts on that question. Uh, I want to go back to something that Jana said about being a nurse. Um, who is in the building you know, five days a week. We've got a question here from Shari, who says that she has been told that since she's shared with two school districts and she's in many different buildings, that health goals and medication should not be on the IEP or the IHP, I believe she means, since she's not always in the building to administer the meds or deal with the goals. Um, she also asks, uh, you know, where does where does this get filed? Uh, typically in the school nurse's office, but what about the scenario where you know where you're in many places? This is where we go back to your Nurse Practice Act of your state um, in terms of what are you allowed to delegate? Um, how many? what are the parameters in your uh, school districts and apparently you're covering more than one um, it is essential that you have the information because if you're not on that day and someone is covering for you how will they find that information how can they answer questions on that information so yes it should be filed um, it should in some be somewhere that can be easily accessed by whoever your substitute is. But again, it, it all goes back to what you can delegate and what you can't, and that is different in every single state. Right, I'm so if this sure person was- I got all the answers though. Yeah, so I'm, this is Kathy. So I would say if we're talking about IHPs, it's still a documentation of the care required for the student. Um, but when, when I hear Ryan saying words like goals, I think it, the person might be talking about the IEP. Um, and so it, it's this is a little more complicated than a brief a brief response during a webinar. <laughs> Maybe we need to do another webinar on delegation. Um, but the, the first thing is, is if the student needs it and it is going to be a part of their IEP, then it should be documented in a goal. Just because um, you can document a goal that's related to medication administration and then delegate some of the components of that to the person that's present at school every day. So you may not be present every day at school. The student can still have that goal. You can delegate it if, again, as Janice pointed out, it's proper under your Nurse Practice Act. And then your responsibility as a nurse is to oversee the competence of the person who you delegated to and then to oversee how the student is making progress to the goal. Just because you've written the goal doesn't mean that you um, necessarily, again, depending on your Nurse Practice Act, are the person um, imp implementing um, the nursing service. So the flip side of that would be is if you did have to have a nurse to provide that service and the student needs that service, um, legally the, the student's entitled to that service and so the the problem because becomes um not having the proper um amount of nursing time or, or nursing personnel to um appropriately meet the student's iep so you can't just say i can't put it on the iep because i don't have time to do it 
the law says if the student is entitled to it, then it must be provided. So I, I hope that helps if that if what you were getting at was the IEP. And I feel a little passionately about that. Could you hear it yeah. in, my, in my voice? <laughs> This is this is Rob and, and Sherry. This your your um, your predicament is so common, way way too common. And it's a good thing we're not on video because I'm a redhead, but my hair is on fire whenever um, I hear uh, about these scenarios. So what uh, bottom line is is under IDEA and even 504, um, you have to go back to the administrators in the school board and and make this a matter of uh, really social justice. And these are the students' federal civil rights. So, and if their school district can't afford the necessary health services that a child needs to participate in their um, education, then it's a violation of their civil rights. And that is overseen by the Office of Civil Rights. And the last thing the school district wants to do is be on the opposite side of the Office of Civil Rights. It's, it's a big, big problem. So. So really, these are these are fundamental civil rights of the students, and they must be afforded. And the school district has to figure out how to do that. So we wish you all the luck. Good luck to you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you all for that. Um, we are running short on time, so I'm going to end with a question that's really more of a comment, and it echoes something that that Kathy said just a moment ago. Uh, Gloria says, bravo, thank you all for your leadership and for a great webinar. This should be a three-part webinar series for the Year of the Nurse to connect with us further and share knowledge. Thank you again. And I would like to echo those sentiments. Thank you, uh, Janice, uh, Kathy, and Robin, for the time that you've taken today. This has really been a lot of great information. To everyone who is, is on with us, if we did not get to your question, I apologize. We will try to, uh, to get back to you directly um, with an answer to your question. Uh, just so everyone knows, we will be sending out a link to the recorded presentation. I saw a couple of, of comments about people who had trouble with the audio. We do host all of our webinars on our YouTube channel, and we will be emailing all of you a link to, uh, to, to view this at a later time. Um, also, if you had colleagues who weren't able to join, if you'd like to share it with them, uh, the link to the YouTube channel will be coming out to you um, pr probably later today. So again, thanks everyone for, uh, for your time and for joining us uh, today. And I will go ahead and end the broadcast now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.